Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 95, Picky Eaters, dealing with players not trying new things. I'm Sean in the North, and live from Windsor in the South, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. You can join in live on Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right. In addition to our main topic of gaming's picky eaters, I've got a review of Exchange. This is another new light strategy game from Bicycle Cards. Uh, as for our Bellhops tabletop segment, I've got in uh, another play, well, a few plays of Unlabeled, the blind beer tasting game. Uh, another look at Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. That's a prototype. I know people are excited to hear about that. Another play of Fox in the Forest. And I took out something classic, an older abstract game game called GIF. I think that's how it's pronounced anyway. G-I-P-F. At least it's, it's I don't know. All, all the games in that series have weird names, but G-I-P-F. <laughs> well, maybe it's GIF. <laughs> I, I'm not even going to get into that argument. Uh, also, I got in another game of Quad Heroes with my girls. Uh, this is the first time with the kids playing without the tutorial rules. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interaction with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We crave your comments and suggestions. <laughs> if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media. I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Now, up first, a comment from Metac188 on our list of best intro area control games. I missed New York 1901 while I was researching. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, Metac. It's awesome that people are doing research and finding us. That's great. Now, Chris Groff has a question after listening to our Renegade Con cap last week. Are you planning on attending Gen Con online? All right. Um, at this point, I haven't had a chance to actually dive into what Gen Con online is doing. Um, we talked about this last week after Renegade Con. I was looking forward to Origins Online, and I was looking at what was going on in Origins Online, but that kind of imploded last week um, on the day we were recording, which was interesting. So since that's now been canceled, I think Gen Con Online might be the next big one but I haven't actually had a chance to take a look at what's going on. Now, I will say if it's free, I'm sure I'll take part in some way. Like if there's free panels, free things to attend, free games to play, I'm probably going to jump in, same way I did for Renegade. Now, if they are going to charge, if there is some fee to take part in Gen, Game, Gen Con Online, I'm going to have to think about it. So, first of all, I don't normally attend Gen Con. It's, it's just too big and... Not what I want out of a gaming convention. Like, I want to be able to interact with people, hang out, talk, meet old friends, and sit down, spend time together and play games. Whereas Gen Con's more of a shop. It's it's more of a trade show. You're, you're getting shorter engagements with people for shorter times. More of a, hey, how's it going? Good, good to see you. Separate because everyone's too busy. That, to me, doesn't sound that appealing. So I never really thought about going to Gen Con online, but if it's anything like Renegade Con, I do want to kind of check it out. But again, it's going to depend if they charge money or not. That, that'll be a thing. And if they do charge money, what I'll try to do is apply as press. Because what I will do is if I do go, I will let everyone here know how it went, just as I did with our Renegade Con. Because I do want to try more online game conventions. Because Renegade Con was surprisingly good. All right, well, to Mujin, our Gloomhaven guy in the chair commented <laughs> on our Sanctum unboxing that went live this past Monday. I picked this game up right before things started shutting down, so I haven't had a chance to get it to the table yet. Hopefully, it plays as good as it looks. Well, thanks for the comment, Tamujin. I'm sure you're looking forward to us getting back to playing Gloomhaven probably about as much as we are. So far, Sanctum, I only played once, so I can't give, I don't want to give my final thoughts at this. This is no final verdict, but um, it's fun. It was good. It was um, definitely heavier than I thought it was going to be, without being heavy, just more of a, a brain burner than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be a lighter game, which actually 
to me is very symbolic of CG, check games edition. Like you look at Dungeon Lords and you're like, oh, it's this light, fluffy game about drinking a dungeon and killing heroes. And you're like, no, that is a super heavy brain burn. So yeah, it's it's definitely, there's more involved than, than it first looks. And same with Adrenaline, which is by the same designer. You look at Adrenaline, you're like, oh, it's a first person shooter. And you're like, oh, wow, they really use the area to control mechanics to make a first person shooter that works so this is no exception to the cge more complicated than it looks but still good series of games all right well and finally it seems daily magic games found our horizons review on board game geek mm. left this comment great review thanks for playing our game Oh, thanks, Daily Magic. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, thank you for publishing such a good game. And also thanks to Levi Moat for designing it. He was actually in our chat when we first did recorded that review, which was pretty cool. And as usual, I just thumbs up to any publisher who actually takes the time to not only watch our content, but comment and interact. That is just awesome to see. That's one of the things I love about Daily Magic. All right, well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you're on a social media site, we're probably there too. But if we're not, let us know and we'll rush right over. Yeah, there, there's, I, I don't know, there's not many we're not on in some form or another that I've at least made an account. I'm at least squat, mainly squatting the account so no one else can take the username. But we're there, like I'm on TikTok, there's no videos, but I have an account. I sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email that recaps all of our content we released the week previous. All our blog posts, uh, unboxing videos, YouTube content, actual plays, whatever we put out, we throw in that newsletter. It is the best way to keep up with everything we put out week to week. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. All right, so upcoming this week, um, I had yet another package show up this past week. It's behind me over here um, with some games. This is coming from The Op. Uh, this means I'm going to have even more games to get unboxed. Now, for those of you here live, stick around after the show, and you'll get to see what's in the box. You'll get to see what I'll open up the, uh, the shipping package, but not the individual games. Now, I don't know when, but before next Wednesday, I'm really hoping on sitting down and doing some unboxing videos. The thing is, with the kids home and not at school, it's going to be really dependent on what we can do to the distract them to keep them quiet during the day. But I do hope to get them done by Wednesday. Well, watch our social media feeds, and we'll be sure to let everyone know when we're going live. All right, we are very quickly coming up on the end of June. I don't know, this month just flew by. Like, I can't believe that, like, this week is the last Wednesday of the month. Yeah, next week, June 24th, we'll be having our start of summer Q&A, where we'll be answering questions from our chat room live. Now, if you can't join us on the 24th at 9 p.m. right here on Twitch, and but I have a question you'd like us to answer live um, on air as it is, uh, you can get in touch with us on social media before then, or send us a voicemail. Just fire up Skype, call Sean, that's S-E-A-N, at tabletopbellhop.com, leave a message after the beep. Next Wednesday, we'll play your message over the air and answer it as part of our AMA. I want to know who's going to be the first person. Someone's got to leave us a voicemail. I want to, I want to know who it's going to be that leaves us our first voicemail. So as we announced last week, our two-year anniversary is coming up next month. And one of our goals that we set uh, is to hit the arbitrary number of 500 subscribers on YouTube before our two-year anniversary. Well, right now we're at 500, 435 subs. And the best gift you could give us to celebrate this milestone that costs you nothing is to subscribe to our channel. You don't even have to turn notifications on. You don't want to spam anyone. No, that's not our goal. Now, if you already subscribed uh, to you, give us an equally valuable gift would be to spread the word and share a link to our channel. Finally, thank you to everyone who has already subscribed to us. Rock. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat, some content that otherwise only our patrons get. All right, so what do we got going on in the lobby? Uh, I will admit, all right, so so Terrence pointing out that the Daily Magic Games kind of did the uh, have a great summer written in the back of the rule book. And yes, I admit, it doesn't take much to say, thank you for reviewing our game. But you know what? how many companies don't? 
Yep. Like, out of all the reviews I have ever posted anywhere, we have had so few. Daily Magic Games, Horizons in particular, has gotten comments a couple times. Aloy Santa actually got in touch with me with the Mermaid Adventures review from last week. But, like, I've never heard any... Well, you've heard from Isaac, I mean... <laughs> yeah, I, Isaac, well, yeah. We've heard from Isaac, yeah, uh, about about our FAQ. Like, there, there's been a few, but it, to be honest, it's few and far between, and it yeah. doesn't take a lot of effort. So I always appreciate it when any company does take that small step to say thank you. Well, thank you for the sub, Will Chamberlain. Uh, a lot, other than that, uh, a lot of our pre-show chatter that, that continued on to the show is about the Terraforming Mars Kickstarter that's live right yeah. now where there is a lot of money on the line. They are well past funded uh, in order to get uh, basically upgrades for everything. There's no very, very little new content to the game, but it is supremely upgrading a lot of the existing content. And if you haven't jumped in, um, you can pick up nice, some nice bundles of ways to get into the game whole hog. Yep. Now, I do know um, Andrew Dacey, a uh, fan of the show, I think he's one of our patrons even, is, is looking to pick it up in the UK. And in the UK, the bundle deal to get everything is four pounds cheaper than buying it at the local store. But you also get the box and all the inserts, right. like yeah, like yeah. just the, the price for the game. So you're saving four pounds and getting all the upgraded content the the better components the tr- player trays the card sleeve well no the card sleeves aren't there but the card box and all of that now that was without the add-ons and i got to say this is something i didn't mention when we were talking about this earlier is one of the things i am frustrated by is what are add-ons and what aren't like i like i have been thinking i probably should have sleeved my copy of terraforming mars i don't sleeve anything but we play that game enough some of the cards are kind of nasty to be honest so having sleeves for that game would be great but it's 50 bucks for the sleeves and i'm like i know card sleeves aren't cheap but still but they aren't that expensive i mean (laughs) that's a lot i mean yes you get a lot of cards i we 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 haven't talked about it before there's a lot of cards involved in terraforming mars but still to just buy card sleeves for those just merit clear card sleeves not going to cost you fifty bucks. Yeah, I to, to be honest, I I know buy card sleeves. So maybe someone in the chat knows how much five hundred and fifty card card sleeves would cost. Now these are branded, right? Like there's different backs for the different types of cards. It's not just generic card sleeves, but yeah, I I don't know. And then yeah, the other one is sixty dollars for metal resource cubes, whereas the game already has metal resource cubes, but they're technically plastic that have been um whatever that chrome coating is, whatever it's electrostatic coating right. or whatever it's called, that same thing that they do with chrome. And personally, I think they look fine. I don't need the metal. I just, the heft of it would be nice. They wouldn't slide as much because they'd be heavier and it'd be a nice touch. But $60, the game doesn't even cost that much now. Like, yes, the MSRP is more than that, but you can get the, the full game for cheaper than that. So the, so the that, first, one, that one's it. <laughs> the first Amazon.com link that came up when I searched for 500 card sleeves is $10. Yeah, so... Yeah, I mean, you're, I think those are super cheap, and, and and those are you know those are going to be like baseball card size or something. But still, you're you're not going to hit fifty bucks too easily. Yeah. So I don't. Good good luck for Excelius and yeah, uh, Stronghold. Well. Like they're doing well enough. I I'm on the fence. I can't decide. I play the game enough. It's tempting. Having a better storage solution be nice, and I dig the three D tiles, especially once the world calms down and people are allowed to gather again. I do a lot of public play events and that'll look good on the table, but how often nowadays, now that the game's been out this long, am I going to do a big Terraforming Mars demo too? So, you know, I'm, I'm wishy-washy. So what they're doing now is every day they're releasing a new promo. Now these promos are supposedly only going to be available in the Kickstarter. And I think that's, what's eventually going to make up my mind. If, if I see something in those promos and I'm like, oh, I kind of need that. Though I don't know what the heck it could be, to be honest, because just a bunch of more projects and corpse, I have plenty. I haven't played all of them yet. Yeah, it's. I mean, you get so much between the original game and all the expansions, which you've already got. You know, it, it's going to, you're going to really, I mean, if a corpse that good, it could actually be a game breaker. <laughs> right. You know, that's one yeah. of those things like, yeah, that's an awesome corp, but if whoever gets it will win the game, what's the point? I don't know. I will see more prelude cards. It'd be something. So if you're listening, Stronghold, more prelude cards might actually tempt me because that is something I would like to see more of. Because prelude's an awesome expansion, and put prelude on the digital version. Dang it! Oh, put, put anything prelude on the in version. Steam so it doesn't take us four and a half hours to play with experienced players. Yeah, put put any <laughs> expansion on. Yeah, and no, just I don't care. Rest. I just I, all I want. 
is the one. I want Prelude. I'll right. stop complaining after Prelude. All right. All right. Moving on. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can pretty much type in your social media site of choice slash Tabletop Bellhop and hit us. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website because they get nice and logged and I get a notification when they show up and I get a special email and all this stuff, which is awesome. But I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Tonight, we have two different questions that both deal with similar game night problems. So we've decided to group them together for tonight's topic. Up first, Ranch B writes, what to do when you have a steady weekly group? As time goes by, you've got one player who is getting less willing to play other games. After mm -hmm. four players all say, ooh, let's play that, player five is the only one doing, often doing the, I don't think I'd like that. Let's play something else. Oh, thanks for the question, Ranch. Uh, this is definitely something I have seen many times, uh, both with like my regular game group that gets together all the time, as well as private or public gaming events. Actually, it's to be honest, more common at public gaming events, but it is definitely something that occurs quite often. And I think we're going to have some ideas to help you. Second, David Wood writes, do you have any solution for the RPG picky eater? I'm defining picky eater as the sort of player who only ever plays one type of character or only ever plays one type of game. Uh, it doesn't handle the paradigm shift to a different system or setting well at all. Mine in this case is a power gamer, prefers <laughs> superhero systems, and only suffers the minimal amount of story required <laughs> to get into fights, gain enough experience to buy new power. Now, there's another one I've definitely seen many times over the years uh, on both sides of the screen as a GM running the game and as a player and having the other player in or another player in the group who's kind of stuck in their way. So thanks for the question, David. Now, yes, these are two separate questions, but really to me, both of these are talking about a game group and a social situation where one person out of the group is looking for a totally different experience from the rest of the group. And that is something that is surprisingly common, like possibly always common. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's definitely uh, something that, that hits a lot of people. And I, the root of it, in many cases, is fear. Uh, you know, we've got the fear of change or fear of something new or related to the two is just the fear of looking bad or incapable of doing something other than they're really good, what they feel they're, they're yeah. comfortable and good at. It's a comfort thing. Yeah. So I, I don't know. To, there's, there's a few different ways to look at this, and we're probably going to wind all over the place here. So just, just fair warning where we don't have a one-track answer at this point. This is something I, I left open up to discussion, and it is pretty awesome that it ends up that, that David's actually in our chat room tonight. So thank you for joining us for your, your answer. So we can we'll get to hear live if, if we do this one right or we screw it up. So I think the first thing you need to do, and this is for both cases, is try to find out why. Why why do the people only want to play one thing? Is it fear, like Sean said? Is it is it they're, they're scared to try something else? Is it a comfort level thing? Are they just more comfortable doing this? Is it someone who is scared, not scared to learn something new, but like learning's work. To be honest, like like having to learn a new game, a new system is work, and not all people want to have to work to have fun. If I just show up and I play Catan every week, I already know how to play. I don't have to learn anything new. I just sit down, I play, I have fun. There's no there's no effort required. So that can be it. If they just want to chill and relax and have a good time with friends, if that's what they're there for, is not the game, but the social aspect of hanging with friends, maybe they don't want that investment. Because especially with an RPG, if you were switching RPG systems, there is a usually, I will say usually, there are some obvious modern example or exceptions to this, but usually there's a significant learning curve. Even just, same with even playing a different character type, right? If you, especially superhero games, because except for the fact that there's now like masks, the, until very recently, there were not light superhero games. Every superhero game had powers and how powers work and time tracks and people that act at super speed versus people who don't and very 
complicated point by system superhero games have never been light and fluffy yeah. the, 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 until now like i said nowadays with power video apocalypse games like icons and games like masks it's it's there has been that shift but it's definitely a thing so even if you're playing a superhero game switching from the brawler to the speedster is a learning curve yep absolutely and again it's it's really it's really a uh hard to say what might be causing the problem uh like yeah. for me personally again when we're, we're talking board games i'm pretty much to try anything once i mean you play, yeah. you'll 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 say hey do you want to play this game and the only reason i'm probably going to say no is oh i'm way too tired for that much brain burn or mm -hmm. uh i just played the you know killer level four you know four difficulties in a row i would really love to play beans right now because i need yeah. a break you know that's the sort of reason why i'm going to say no but on a regular, ongoing basis, pretty much up to try everything. Uh, another thing you might watch out for is there could be another reason, separate from what we've talked about, why they might be saying no. And this could be a group interaction problem. And this is something that we get, we've get we talked about multiple times, and it gets into your session zeros and your comfort levels with everybody in there. There's always a possibility that they may not like the way Somebody at the table behaves if you're playing, mm -hmm. you know, worst case scenario, Monopoly. Hey, look, you know, I don't want to play Monopoly. And they don't want to say that, you know, Billy Bob is a complete jerk every time we play Monopoly. Mm -hmm. It's just not a fun experience. They just say, mm, I don't really like playing that game. Uh, so that's another no, that's underlying, underlying issue that could be when it comes to board games um, or even RPGs. You know, if, if behavior of other people is pushing them away from from the uh yeah that's that's very fair especially with different styles of games right like board games we 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 have whole episodes on dealing with problem players with um talking about confrontation at the table and competitiveness but a lot of it could be people who are scared of com uh, the competitive nature of the game right like let's play this because we always let's, let's keep playing pandemic i want to keep playing pandemic and then like no let's play i trying to think a uh, risk i a terrible example in a way because i'm going for a perfect traditional game but well or, or let's try to think of cry havoc right so an in your face confrontational you are going to be against each other players and they may be like you know what now let's just keep playing pandemic and it ends up that they just don't like confrontation in the games and for whatever reason are worried about bringing that up which gets to like sean saying with session zero and a lot of that just it, it's almost old school feeling like people were scared to explain why they liked or didn't like things or what they liked or what preference they wanted and there was like this mentality that like i have a game night and because i have a game night that's sacred and i don't want to do anything that's possibly threaten that game night and part of that has to do with the fact that gaming was definitely looked down upon and not as common as it is now and it used to be you didn't have the internet so if you knew the five people in your city the game that was it and if you wanted a game you were stuck with them we're past that now for one, more people out there game, and for two, there's the internet, and if you can't game in person, you can definitely find a game online, and I almost guarantee you, unless you're really in the middle of nowhere, there are probably other gamers with similar styles to your type in your area somewhere, and I think that a lot of it stems from that, the, the I don't want to rock the boat, but I'll rock the boat enough to say, no, no, let's just take play what we were playing already, because it's what I know. Like, you're willing to take that step, but not take why. Yeah, and again, and, and this does in some ways play into the fear again. In this place, it's it's fear of confrontation at the party, at the table, right? You at don't the want table. to interpersonal. Offend, you don't want to you don't want to offend anyone else at the table, so you try to be, you know, you do the Canadian thing and and you're overly polite. Yes. And it comes off the wrong way. Uh, you're being polite, you're trying not to hurt anyone's feelings, but in doing that, you may be upsetting everyone else who would really rather just have an answer. Um, you know. It, it would be better to know the truth uh, once than listen to you yeah, waffle like, every like, week. That one conversation is not going to be fun, but it's probably better than having a lousy time every week, right? Like the, yeah. that one time that that one, you know, I, I can't think of the term coming to the table. It's not the term I was looking for, but whatever that that one moment where you kind of like, look, let's sit down. Let's talk about this. So forgetting the why they want to play the one game. I think another part of it and another way to try to, to help deal with this is to find out what it is about that one thing that they like. 
So yes, they always want to play superhero games because they want to power up. Well, is that what they like? Is it the, is it the power fantasy? It is it the leveling up? Is it the math they like? Do they like character building? Do they like min maxing? Do they like how you know the plan a character had ten levels and have everything scheduled? Or for board games, do they like playing Catan because they love the engine building of it and they really like the fact that the dice determine randomly what resources you get every round? And I think that's part of it is trying to figure out what it is they like about that thing. And then as a group, perhaps presenting things that still have that part of the thing, the thing they like, whatever they're getting out of the game they do enjoy, maybe you can introduce them to another game that's similar or has that. If they so, if they love the superhero games and they it's 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 the, the the huge characters and they like being this massive powerful thing and yeah you know I possibly the only time I'll ever say this in my life look at Palladium, um, <laughs> but uh, you know oh, it's totally true yeah yeah there, there's other games out there that aren't in that same genre but still give you that you know I'm gonna be the min max I'm gonna power up I'm gonna kill and and but maybe you're a barbarian or maybe you're a mech or you know. There's, there's other ways to, to get that same experience of the power cycle with another game. See, I, like what you can do, though, is you can suggest things that are similar to what they like, right? So if they like D&D, right, and they, and they like it, so you subtract the Pathfinder, right? It's just that little step to the side, or maybe Adventures in Middle Earth. Or if they're really into Cyberpunk, maybe you push them towards Shadowrun. And then the next time, you go a little bit further from Shadowrun, you move over to On the Edge. And then from On the Edge, maybe you push them a little, and you just, you keep trying to incorporate that thing they like, right? You don't want to pull people too far from their comfort zone. Again, assuming that's the main reason why this person doesn't want to shift, is they're comfortable and having fun with what they're doing. They like Catan, find out what it is what they like. If it's the trading aspect, maybe show them Bonanza or Chinatown. If it's the dice-based resource production, maybe take a look like Valeria Card Kingdoms. Like, we've actually got an entire episode about if your player likes Catan and won't play anything else, here are some other games to suggest. And we basically broke it down into, if they like this aspect of Catan, check this out. Now, that's way more specific than this. This is more generic. But just an idea of what you can do to try to shift them over. And then... Similarly to that, uh, you know, if you started off as a Catan group, but, you know, it's been a year and you guys are all trying to switch things up now. So you're trying a different game. Maybe they want to be in a Catan group and that's not your group anymore. Yeah. Then maybe it's time for them to move on. Uh, maybe the, the problem isn't that you've got a picky eater, eater in your group. The problem is that they don't belong in that group anymore and mm -hmm. they're looking for another group, but you don't want to get rid of them and they are terrified to say this isn't doing it for me anymore i want to leave sometimes you really do just have to you know break the bond and go your separate gaming ways or not even that right like say bob loves Catan. every time you're going to play Catan, you call bob when you're going to play twilight imperium you don't but maybe you give Bob a heads up. Hey, we're, we're getting together for game, but you know what? We're playing Twilight Imperium. We know it's not your thing, but you know what? Next week, we're going to play Catan. I'll call you up next week. Yeah. And if Bob's just there for the social thing, you can also say, hey, we're playing Twilight Imperium. We're probably going to finish up around 6 a.m. If you want to head over, we can hang out after the game. Maybe not the best ex uh, example. Yeah, I, I realized yeah. that when I, soon, as, <laughs> soon as I went from Twilight Imperium and ending. But, right? uh, yeah, uh, no, but that's definitely it, right? Like, to me, I think you, you first the thing where you suggest is there some way like sit down find out why why do you like this what what is what you like about this thing what can we do to have you try something else are you willing to try something else now the answer might be straight up no and if the answer is no then you're at that point you're at the well this is what we're going to keep doing in this group and if you want to keep participating you, you know we're going this way are you coming with us and you know what? And the compromise could be, you know what? Every other week we'll play your game. Or you know what? We're going to run two sessions of this. We'll go back and play a superhero game. But it, the, it sounds like at that point, it's time for superhero person to sit on the side and get into another group for a couple weeks, right? Yep. And then come back the next time you're running a superhero game. Like, you don't have to break off the friendship just because you don't like the same games, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Our, our, gaming, <laughs> our gaming cells aren't necessarily tied together with our friendships. Absolutely. And again, it's it's not necessarily, you know, you have to say goodbye to them and you never see them again, but yes. maybe Wednesday, the Wednesday night gaming night isn't going to be their gaming night at your house anymore. They're yeah. going to go find Jane, who's running, you know, uh, Mutants and Masterminds every Wednesday night yep. that they didn't even know about. Um, and 
it was so they go over there and they they play their super they get their super on and then yep. Sunday afternoons is Catan night back at you know Dave's house. Yep. And and the other thing too is there are a lot of people who do this. There are a lot of games. We're obviously not that, or we'd have a very boring podcast. We are not people who only play one game. But there are a lot of people who play one game a lot, a ton. The 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 lifestyle games. It's definitely. A thing that there are people, especially Dungeons and Dragons, there are people who play Dungeons and Dragons and will never play anything else. And there are people who have felt that way since 1974 and still have played Dungeons and Dragons. And there's people who started playing last month who refuse to play anything else, too. There are definite fans of Dungeons and Dragons specifically and pretty much every other RPG out there. Same with board games. There are groups out there there is one here in windsor that gets together every sunday and has well i don't know about right now when things were normal has three to six tables of Catan playing every sunday in someone's backyard and that's what they did they played Catan. they had command tournaments and they love it and there's a good chance your picky eater could probably find these groups there are groups like this now you may be stuck with playing online like it's again depending on where you live like we're in windsor windsor's not that big the fact that there's a group that plays Catan every sunday there's probably a group that plays your favorite game too absolutely that's so many chance for them to join that group yeah and i mean again now that we're you know now that we're in a in a pandemic world or a post-pandemic world or you know however you want to call it um the the online options have only expanded since so if you're a board game player you know we've got an episode that looks at some great options online uh and we still haven't even really delved into the virtual tabletops that deeply with tabletopia Mm -hmm. and tabletop simulator um, if you're an RPG guy, uh, person, there is the Roll Twenties of the world. There's Discord. I mean, you know, we've there are Discords just for Powered by the Apocalypse. Oh yeah, Roll Twenty yeah. has all the options out there. There's a Kickstarter we were discussing earlier that is about to come out. That's for that lighter type of game where it's it, mm-hmm. you don't need all the ha- fancy maps. You get a whiteboard, the cameras, the dice rollers, and some some tools, and you're good to go. Uh, you know, if if you are a picky eater. You have options out there in the world right now that can cater to you. And you, I don't think it's a good thing, but you can continue to be that picky eater for as long as you want if you're willing to go out there and find this, find it. All right, that actually brings me to my next point. Why is the picky eater a problem? Like, especially now, this is looking at the RPG side of things, right? If you have a player in your group that plays a barbarian orc every time that maxes out their strength and maxes out their con and always uses a two-handed sword and buys the monkey grip feet so they can use two two two-handed swords one-handed and always uses the sunder move to start the combat, if they're having fun, so what? Who cares? Like, I see no problem with letting a player do that. Now, back in the day, back in the 80s and 90s growing up, there was this pressure to try new things. And I have no idea where this came from. Like, I, I think just push back again. That people wanted you to try other systems. But there was the, like, people would show up to my table. And Sean always played Thieves, for example. And Sean would show up, and I'm like, great, we're going to play Warhammer. But you know what? You can't play anything from the Thief. You can't play an Outlaw Chief. You can't play a Scoundrel. You can't play a you got some kind of warrior type because you never did. and i forced on to do that and then my other gene is over and i'm like no you are playing like a pacifist monk who's gonna talk a lot and there's no way you're using a weapon and i make him do it and you know what that first session kind of went all right and it always fell apart because i was forcing people to play things they didn't want to play or have fun like trying to make them have fun with things they weren't doing So then I let Sean go back to being a thief and let Gene play as whatever cleric of whoever worshiping some holy book. And they are now having a better time. I don't think people playing the same character all the time is bad necessarily, unless it's somehow affecting the group. But like, I have a hard time seeing how that can affect the group unless you have a problem player in the first place, like not just a picky eater. Like if you've got that person who wants to play the, the Wolverine, the Boba Fett, the lone wolf, who's like, we all go into town. And then they're like, no, I refuse to go into town. I go off into the woods or you're playing the, the character who's secretly evil or the thief that Sean didn't play. Thankfully, who was always stealing stuff from the party members. Right. Like unless, but that's a different thing. That's, that's a, a problem player, not just a picky eater. That's someone whose fun is to ruin other people's fun. And that's someone you should be kicking out of your group as soon as you can. And maybe they can find another group of loners and they can go have fun somewhere, or maybe they can get into video games. Cause I don't think there's really a place for those people in our hobby anymore. Yeah, no, absolutely. And now good. Just touching back. I think a lot of the pressure or new that we were experiencing 
a lot to do with the group we were playing. We were playing with yeah. the Windsor Board Gaming Society, which was a collective of RPGers and board gamers. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we were being exposed every week to this group of people who, I think, for good or bad, were playing a lot of different games. And, and yeah. you know, there was an encouragement to either join in with them or try something with them and, and, and experience all these different games, which is, I think, a lot of why we aren't picky eaters. Um, yeah. But I, there was also a little bit of extra pressure where, I mean, there was no reason we couldn't have sat there and just done our own thing and used the space mm -hmm. that became available to us. Um, but we were happy to try a whole bunch of different things, and I think yeah. better for it. I mean, the number of gaming systems I played as a teenager is a lot more than most people of that in that day and age. I and mean, nowadays mm -hmm. it's different to be varieties yeah. out there. But at the time, I mean, you know, most people were playing D&D. Um, or maybe Warhammer if you were in an area where there was a, War a, a GW store, um, but not much else, whereas we had a whole lot of people, a whole lot of different mm -hmm. games, including a lot of really original and complex homebrews. Yeah. Yeah, we had a lot of local game designers, right? Like yeah. like Palladium, where our, our local, were local independent game designers at the time. So Kevin Symbiata, and I am totally forgetting the other person who was part of Palladium back in the day, used to come to Windsor and run their games before they were published, and they had local playtesters here in Windsor. Eric Woodjick, there. I don't know why I couldn't remember that earlier. <laughs> Richard Tohoka lives in Detroit and yeah. would come over here and run his... Uh, uh, what, what did he... He did um, all those... Uh, not necessarily politically correct games nowadays, we'll just say. I, I won't get into actual names, but he, he wrote a bunch of others. We had Eric, and um, that guy wrote, wrote Fist with it, Faster Than Light. The the designer of Bureau 13 showed up and debuted his new game, Stalking the Night Fantastic, right? Like, there was definitely that. But even back at that time, there was a group that played D&D &D and only played D&D. &D. Yep. Uh, Brian used to be the DM, yep. and he used to run for like 16 players at times. And I'll admit, Sean and I were jerk kids and we used to call that the wall of stupidity because they wouldn't play other systems and that kind of gets me back to my point like is there a problem with this right like so what if they want if, if dave only wants to play Catan, you invite dave to Catan night yep. and and have that conversation which i think leads us back to i think the main thing is talking session zero right uh we've talked about session zeros for role-playing games it's now a pretty common thing like it's not weird like, people now know the term. They hear it all the time. But I still think Session Zero should be happening for board game groups. If you have a group and you sit down and you're like, look, we're going to get together every Wednesday and start playing games. And sure, maybe the first couple times it happens ad hoc. But once you're down to once a week we're going to get together, you should sit down and set expectations. Not just for your 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 who brings the food um, how, what type of language we're going to use, what type of content we want on our table, do we allow adult games stop, what kind of games are we going to play? Are we going to play this thing every week or we mix it up? Are we going to play one game until we've mastered it and then move on to something else? Same thing for a role-playing group. So not even just session zero for we're about to start playing our new D&D &D campaign, but hey, we're about to sit down and get our group together and play a game what are we going to play just have that discussion is everyone gonna are you gonna hey steve are you gonna play your your barbarian again or is that your plan is play a barbarian because that's cool play your barbarian but i need to know so that i can work the story around there being the badass barbarian but if you want to try something new that's cool too right like that conversation and then make sure everyone has buy-in right um phil vecchione dna phil is famous for saying you want enthusiastic consent before the end of your session zero. Everyone in that room should be excited for what's gonna happen next. And if you're not, something's wrong and you should try to find out what that is and fix it. Now that might be, I'm sorry, Steve, you know what? We had great time playing Catan. We played every week. We had a lot of fun with Catan, but I'm sick of it. Sean's sick of it. Deanna's sick of it. Well, Deanna wins all the time. I don't even know how you can have fun playing when she wins all the time. We really want to move on to something else. You know what? There's this great group on Facebook. It's called this. I know they play Catan there. Why don't you check them out? Maybe you can start hanging out with them. And you know what? Next time we're going to have a Catan night, we'll give you a call. Or you know what? We're going to be playing Shadowrun for the next little while. We want to play these corporates and whatever. And you know what? If you want, like, you're welcome to play. You can play a street samurai. They're basically like superheroes. You can get all kinds of cyberware. be all like a lot of ass. But if it's not for you, you know what? Next time I'm going to run Marvel, I'll give you a call. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, the next thing, so the, the, the stage two of this is 
you've got a successful group and you've been going on for a long time. Don't think you can't have another session zero. Session zero yes. mark two. So if you've been playing for a year, maybe there have been some feelings developed between players. Maybe, you know, maybe that, that unspoken, I don't want to play that game because that guy's mm -hmm. a jerk whenever he plays it, has developed over this year. Or maybe some habits of one of the players have, have sort of crept into the game that no one was expecting, and everyone's been kind of smiling and nodding about, but it's starting to become a problem. So, at, at a, you know, pick a time. It doesn't have to be every six months or every three months or every year, but after a while, uh, maybe you, you f people feel like things are becoming too comfortable. Have a pause. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even have to be a whole night. Have another session zero and talk about the experience for open up and see if there are problems, see if there's, if yep. there are conflicts going on and stop it from becoming a bigger problem somewhere else. You don't want a table flip. You don't want to storm yeah. out. You want to catch all that stuff before it gets to that level. Very true. Now I would actually recommend doing this separate from a game night if possible. Like I think if I was going to take my Monday night group, and sit down and have this conversation. I'd be like, you know what? Normally Monday night we get together. Why don't we meet up for pizza down at Roma's just down the street? We'll get a pitcher of beer. We'll sit, talk about it, and then have that conversation. And then maybe if there's time left in the, the night, we'll come back to my place and play a game. Like, I almost want to separate it from the game night just to have it so people know this isn't the regular night. We're, we're talking about things to separate it. I just think that it kind of change the egos, change the mindset. So you're in the mindset of thinking about it instead of in the moment of we're about to play. The only, the only other, the only issue I would be concerned about is if you uh, context shift too much. Uh, you know, if you're all out having a good time having beer and pizzas, maybe Jake and Jen get along great when you're out having pizza and beers. Yeah. But there's a conflict at the table, and so that's the only thing that again somebody has to be aware of. Um, whereas if you say, "All right, look, we." Uh, we just finished the dungeon. Uh, next week, before we go back to town, let's take a little while and talk about how things are going, and mm. then we'll then we'll start up in the in the city and, and get going. I, again, that's just it's all things that you have to watch out for. It's cues. Yeah. It's it's you know more than likely you've probably seen some tension. Uh, the, the the key is to make sure you don't ignore it. Make a note somewhere, or you know pay pay attention to the little cues that in the past may have gone missed so that you can take them up on that on your session zero mark two the other thing too is don't surprise people with this like don't have everyone don't show up <laughs> expecting to play and be like right. no nope, sorry inter interjection what is that it's intervention, intervention. yeah we're no. having an intervention we're all sitting down yeah. dave we don't like no don't do that that's seriously yep. that that's that's reality tv thing that doesn't actually work in real life um another note we're talking about this, and I bet you most people in their head are thinking we're talking to the DM. That isn't necessarily true. This can be for anyone in the group or at the table. You don't have to be the leader. You don't have to be in the leadership role or be the person behind the screen to bring these things up. If there is a problem, you can say, hey, can we, you know, next week, instead of playing, I've noticed there's some tensions in the group and things just aren't quite going the way I think everyone wants them to go. Can we just sit down and have like a, a session Z or whatever you want to call it? We need a term for that. A, a partway session Z, because session zero sounds weird. Session zero mark two, session point five. I don't know. Whatever. Like, like can we have one of those? Because... You know what? Just like, it's not just me. Everyone seems a little on edge, and we don't seem to be having a, a, a reboot season session, reboot. Session, that's, session reboot. That's that's not a bad session reboot. That's not a bad term. There's probably someone out there. If I ask the the misdirected Mark crew, they have a term for this already. Seems like there should be a, uh, a an inter a intermission. I think is probably another good word yeah. for it. Let's have an intermission, and you know, let's all go to the lobby, get ourselves a drink, and sit down and <laughs> talk about talk about the game. But overall, um, we kind of covered a lot and we kind of wandered all over. I think your, your first thing, in my opinion, is, is it a problem? Right? Like, like where, where is this coming from? This is actually a problem. It, like, you know, if you can play that one game that the person really likes, you play it every other week and you play other games the other week. And that's a nice, simple compromise that most people can probably get behind. And the weeks you don't play the game, they don't show up. It's not really a problem then, right? Or if, again, the person likes playing a certain character type and it's not interfering with anyone else's fun, who cares? Let them play the, their character type and have their fun. 
like I, nowadays today's modern role playing now if they only want combat and hate the role playing parts that's fine if they shut up during the role playing parts and have fun during the combat parts and let the role players have fun that's perfectly normal in most role playing groups people like those things on different levels it's a slider but if they complain every time there's a role playing scene then you've got a problem then you're not just dealing with a big eater you're dealing with a problem player yeah. And that is something we've talked about dealing with problem players in the past. And that mostly boils down to having an adult conversation, finding the root cause of the problem, finding a solution or parting ways. And and it's not just RPGs that that can happen in uh, a yes. player who will only ever play their game if they get to be the blue meeple. Yes. You know, that's there's that's a problem player. <laughs> uh, and it's it's the same. So sort, again, it's the same sort of thing. If, if that's the problem, who cares? All right, fine. You play blue. Well, I mean, unless it becomes a point where you know, I can't play this yeah. game because you didn't get the blue meeples when you kickstarted it. Uh, you know, you know, there's, there's, again, there, there's a possibility uh, that, that you know this this can exist in both board game and RPG. Um, it's a little more obvious in some ways in, in, than in others, depending on which which side of the RPG board game you're on. But mm -hmm. uh, but problem players are problem players, and that's different than someone who's just, just picky, picky and yeah. you know you find you find little ways to adapt so here's another way to think of it gaming is a social situation and should be treated as such at all times it is the exact same as doing something else i personally like to think of gaming like um uh being on a sports team being in in a league on on a team and i usually bring that up when i'm talking about things like my work not giving me time off to go to game night but giving else, someone else time off to go play ball but not only that, it's you have obligations you to the team, to the people you play with, and everyone needs to be on the same page. So another way to look at it is for picky eaters, and this one I particularly wanted to use because of the term picky eater, is you just stop game night and you decide to order pizza. What happens? It's the exact same social situation as trying to pick which game to play. You're going to have that person It's like, no, no, we get pepperoni and cheese because that's what I like. I want pepperoni and cheese. That's all I ever get. And then you have someone else that's like, well, I'm sick of pepperoni and cheese. I want to try something else. Yeah, why don't you ever try something else? Well, haven't you tried anchovies? And the other person's like, no, no, I only like pepperoni. It's the same situation. How would you handle that? Maybe this time you order pepperoni and cheese. Maybe you get a pepperoni and cheese for them and order another pizza. So you play Catan, then you play another game afterwards. It's the exact same social situation where you have one player wants one thing and a group of other people will want something else and how you would handle it on your team and i want to go up to bat i want to play first and but you're not that good at first but i want to play first or i want we're not even even worse than pizza you finish game night and go where should we go for dinner and everyone's going to throw something out and there's going to be the person who wants to go to taco bell because you always go to taco bell and then there's going to be for no i want to go to a sit down restaurant right it's the, it's the that whole conversation is going to be the same thing it's just you're talking games instead of food or you're talking uh character roles instead of positions on the field yep oh, I, again we we all deal with these kinds of situations all the time uh who in their family doesn't do the where are we going for dinner tonight and yep. and you know depending on how many people are in the family you get x plus two answers um or everyone says i don't care and you still have to make a decision um it's the same thing as board games and rpg and and how you deal with those solutions all the yeah. same problem solving it is it's the same problem it's the same people skills required like it's i don't know it's like i said there's this mentality that like game nights is like sacred cow that has to be treated a certain way and it's special and yes game night's great but it's just another night that you're getting together with your friends your family or your local people your neighbors to do something together yep yes deanna pointed out a really good line picky eater etiquette just because i hate pizza doesn't mean you can't eat it and some of this is on the picky eater. Like, if people are willing to compromise yep. and willing to play your game and willing to let you play your barbarian this campaign, compromise. Like, like be a be an adult about it. If you got to do it this time, let them do their fun thing next time. That's how we, how society works, and how we get to work together and get anything accomplished in this world. Another, because we mean, all I, have our own opinions. And again, a, gr a great example is a, a vegan, right? If you're ordering pizza. The vegan isn't going to eat your pepperoni and cheese, but they aren't going to stop you from eating your pepperoni and cheese. And maybe if everyone's going out to dinner and 
everyone wants to go to this restaurant that doesn't have vegan options. Well, maybe they skip out that week. And then next week, you go to a place that has great vegan or everyone goes and everyone eats vegan yep. the next week. Oh. And if your vegan is the type that won't let you eat pepperoni pizza in front of them and just berate you for doing so all night, maybe, maybe it's time to stop hanging out with that vegan. Yep. No offense to vegans out there. We no. actually know, I know quite a few local gamers who happen to be vegans. And they've had pizza in my basement and did not complain while I ate my pepperoni. All right. Well, I think that's it for our suggestions on what to do when gaming with a player reluctant to try new things. I'm going to head over to the lobby and see if the awesome folk gathered there have anything to add. I see quite a bit going by in the lobby tonight, so this should be a good one. Absolutely. It's been... Do you uh, have anything actually saved up, or should I just start scrolling back? Because I uh, saw some nice... Well, I know uh, uh, Ter Terton, who has been, has been talking a little bit about, uh, you know, some of the problems they were experiencing, which led to these questions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, this, this player, you know, not necessarily the mathy person. And there are other problems with mutants and masterminds, okay. even though they're, they're a player. So at, at some point, it sounds like the, the discussion needs to happen. And, and there yeah. needs to be a discussion between the entire group or even just the host and this one player uh, to really sort of suss out some things and say, look, if we're going to continue, there needs to be a little bit more flexibility. Or, or again, the, the opposite side. Is this person playing? I get it. Like, if you don't want to play superhero games, that's different. But yeah, yeah. when you're playing superhero games, they always play the same character. So what? Yeah. Like, no, I honestly do not see a problem with that. But if you're sick of playing superhero games, point that out. Like, explain it. Say, hey, you know what? We're really sick of playing superhero games. We're going to finish it off. And again, I suggest trying to find a game that scratches the same itch. Like, if you're going to go to D&D, &D, play 4E. Because that gives you these amazing powers and lets you do amazing things and jump across the boards and kill things in single hits and do all kinds of neat, funky, almost magic-like stuff or actually magic-like stuff. If you want to have that slight feel and you, but you want to play a fantasy game, that's going to be as close as you can get. Now, he, on the flip side, he asked, you know, am I the jerk for trying to introduce new things and new ideas? And the answer is no, but yeah. have you talked about it? Right. And again, it's just like if you want to introduce something new is the same. You need to have that same discussion is if you don't want to introduce something new. Uh, yeah. Either way, the discussion needs to be had. We're going to stick doing this and we're never going to change playing Catan, uh, doing anything except playing Catan is a discussion that needs to be had as much as we're going to play Catan this week, Max masks next week and Warhammer 40K the week after that. Right. Mm -hmm. They're all discussion and and how you approach that with the group and maybe changes well the other thing too is it just you perhaps you're the picky eater maybe the rest of the group's perfectly happy playing superhero games like crazy and I, I, I'm, I'm still calling a picky eater but maybe you're the picky eater who always wants to try something different right meanwhile they're perfectly happy with the game that's been going now if you're the dm and they're the players i get how this could be a problem but maybe it's time to let someone else try GMing while you go try another game with another group. Or if you are sick of GMing superhero games, try playing. Play, be a player. Because especially in a superhero game, there are so many options for trying different types of characters. Like, you pretty much infinite amount of options there from the 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 low nerf which is probably as i said <laughs> not the not necessarily the best choice in most rpgs to the space alien who doesn't understand earth to the guy who lives down the street that suddenly has superpowers right like those are all very different ways to play um so if it's just you maybe maybe you are the picky you're like like maybe I'm, i don't want to say the problem but maybe it's you that needs to look and go you know what the rest of the group's having a good time and in that case what i would probably do is continue to run the game for that group but try to find a side gig to keep my my taste like this is what happens with deanna and i on when when all the normal game nights are going on not when we're in quarantine is deanna likes to play the same games multiple times she doesn't like learning new games all the time i like to try new things so what would happen was when we play at home we uh, this is games we played stuff my Monday night group Deanna loves love and we play them and then I go out to play events at places like the CG Realm and I break out all my new stuff to play with strangers and sometimes Deanna joins in and sometimes we find a new favorite and we start playing that on Monday nights as well but that's my compromise is Deanna wants plays of the same game so I'll play the same game with her but when I'm out and about I go play around right and I play lots of games with different people 
Whereas I don't actually know what it feels like to play the same game because I go down to Windsor yes. and no matter what, it's a new game every time. Except for party, uh, you know, party nights. If, if it's New Year's or something, yeah. then then usually some some games that other people have played before will come out and do that. But uh, yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't understand the the concept of playing the new uh, the same game multiple times. That's just strange yeah. to me. <laughs> I don't. I I do both. I I am in. Uh, I'm poly gamerous. I'll play the same game multiple times. I'll play a game once and never go back. And I would happily, if I'm playing four games in a night, I generally prefer them to be four different games. Doesn't necessarily have to be something new. It, my I, my perfect night, like going out to to uh, CD Realm, would be playing two games I already know and trying one new one. Would be a good night for me, because then I get to show off a couple new games and try them with new people, and then I get to try something else. And as Wilk Chamberlain puts out, of course, that first play is extreme anyway. So but, we see, can't. That's, uh... that's actually one of the reasons why I think I, given a perfect world, if if I did live in Windsor and was was able to uh, to be around more, I would actually prefer two games. So a four game night for me would be two games of X and two games of Y because you get the extreme game out of the play. A lot of times yeah. I really, I, I play off the, I don't, I don't game, read yeah. rules. I play uh, the, on BGA. I jump in. I don't read the rules. And when someone invites me to a new game, I just play and I mess it up horribly. And then the next time I'm like, Oh, okay. So if I do this and this and this, I'm going to try and develop a strat an actual strategy for this game. Um, and, and but that's this, the two game system is a little more conducive to the way I just play games and and I because yeah, I experiment more. The the problem is there's not a lot of games I want to play twice in a row, <laughs> especially well, and, long and time is a big it's, thing. It's I mean, you know, it's I don't time I don't want to sit down and play what I like, twice in a row. Yeah, what I like is the same game two weeks in a row. See, the, so that's what I would do, right? I would have two games I know and one new game, and then next week that first game would be the last game from last week. Like, that's what I like to do is break it up. But again, I also have the advantage of pretty much gaming twice a week. So the, the, I can do that, right? Whereas, like, there's, like, a Pulsar, right? When I taught you Pulsar, that was not a game where we were going to sit down and play a second game right in a row. Oh. It's just not that kind of game, right? And most of the games I enjoy are like that. Now, Exchange, which we'll be talking about in a bit, happily, yeah, let's play two. Let's play one, get it, and now play again. So yep. it, it very much depends on the amount of ruling. Whereas, you know, the first time we played Azul, uh, I think we played it yes. like four times sitting in the coffee yep. shop that day. Or Garento. Like yep. Garento, I think we played five times in a row, right? Uh, I think I only played it twice, but that's because I also played uh, the new Azul that night, and I played Richard's new, uh, yep. you know. The, Richard's you know, uh, boxing, boxing yep. night in Canada. Yeah, yeah. All right, we got anything else in the chat before uh, we move on? I think uh, we covered a lot of it. We were sort of dipping into the chat room. Yeah, as we I was went. kind of watching as it was going so, by. Uh, Will Chamberlain's getting Sanctum. We were talking about that in the um, feedback. Really neat game. I think you'll like it. Yeah. Um, more complaints about Terraforming Mars. Uh, so Danielle mentions a friend who is way too competitive and will take over co-op games. Yeah, but that's talk... still better than playing a competitive game with them. Right. And so, we talked. We talked about uh, about uh, the the quarterbacking problems. Before. Yeah. and issues like that it's it's something that that's one of those things where you need to sit down and, and maybe uninvite them from the you know as a group say look we, we if you're going to continue this behavior we're not we have invite you. had to have that conversation with overly competitive players there are, there are a couple locals that take things far too seriously but again session zero right whenever i start teaching a game when i sit down at a table with someone who's new again i do a lot of public events i will point out just as a heads up all of us are here just have fun we're here to play the game i'm gonna play to win but i don't care if i win and lose just so you know this isn't a competition there's no money on the table and i start every game with a new player with some kind of variant of that speech just to set that expectation look i don't want arguments over who's winning a game or overtaking a spot on the board that's not what i'm interested in when i come out to play games and i will present that like as a mini session zero right like just before the game starts again this is board games not rpgs rpgs i have a totally different speech when i start those which is all about you're going to work as a team and there are no evil players and you're not going to steal from other people as i kind of mentioned during the main topic and that is something i used to do at the start of every D&D &D 4E um, Living Forgotten Realms game. 
I would point out, look, you are playing D&D. The tropes of D&D is you are the heroes. So when the farmer comes to you and goes, my God, my chicken is missing, you go, oh, I will help you find your chicken because that's one of the tropes of D&D. And we are playing high fantasy D&D. So that's how I expect you to play this game. And that's how the story is going to go. And trust me, I'll make finding that chicken interesting. And I give a speech like that at the start of every D&D game. And I think that's important. And not enough people do it. Again, it's this whole... I, too nervous to rock the boat, too nervous to say something. I don't know. I don't know what that mentality is, but it needs to go away. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting because, you know, you you have this, you know, you will play competitively, but not aggressively. Yes. I think it's, it's really kind of the, the best way to do it. Whereas I, I struggle in the other direction. Whereas, again, because, again, a lot of it has to do with the fact that most of the time when I'm sitting down, it is a great, you know, I haven't seen you in person yep. in ages. I haven't seen a lot of other people at the table. I haven't had a chat with D or Ian or whoever. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to not ag aggressively try to not win, but yeah. I'm really not necessarily playing competitively even. I mean, right. you know, again, I know what it is. And if I, if I see if, if, I, if an opportunity to play really well and do something cool jumps out at me, I will take it. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> no, I think with you, once you know a game, you become more competitive than I am. Possibly. Again, like I, I think I, once you know it, like once you're at that level where it's, we're yeah, not just hanging out, we're going to play Part of the problem game. is I don't, I don't get to that with too many games, though, so I, oh, don't, yeah. I don't really see that in myself. True. Oh. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, um, so just Deanna's got a good comment here. As a picker eater. So I want to say is the person 99% of the time turns down certain styles of board games. Hello, I hate manual decks. I'm not being, I'm taking my toys and going home. I usually try to get across. You folk can play whatever game you dislike and I can move over to that other game over there or I can entertain myself on my phone, no harm, no foul. And that is the, the kind of picky eater you want, right? So it's like picky eater etiquette. And again, gets into, we talked about, the, the the vegan thing just because I hate a thing doesn't mean you have to hate it too. Knowing knowing you're the picky eater can go a long way. Yes. And sometimes that's the only way you know you're a picky eater is that other people tell you. Um and so and that's part of that whole don't be afraid to call people out. Right? Yeah. Hey. Again, you don't have to be a jerk about it. Yeah. Hey hey Graham, did you realize you do this? Cool. Let's uh let's find a way around it. You know and that it why? Like, is there a reason you need to play this type of character all the time? You realize it's kind of disruptive to the rest of the group, right? Just having those conversations. I admit it. It's not easy, right? Like, here we are saying this, and it sounds like, oh, yeah, sure. Just show up to your game group and do it. I realize I have some social anxieties. I realize the actual, when the people are there in the table in front of you, it may not be the easiest thing to do. But again, one bad night, one tough, hard experience can remove a lot of heartache going forward. Alrighty. Well, so I, that's it for our main topic tonight. Remember, you can find lots of gaming topics and advice like this over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on Gaming Advice at the top of the page. Uh, finally, just a reminder, if you've got a game or game night question like the two we answered tonight, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or fire me off email at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Up next, we have a look at Exchange, a light strategy game soon to be published by Bicycle Games, the company best known for playing cards. All right, I should have edited that because actually the game came out yesterday. Not soon to be published. It was published yesterday. We're like one day late. My bad. I, that's my fault in the notes because I looked it up and ran, ran it in the wrong time. So anyway, so this game's got some interesting backstory. At least I thought it was interesting, and I had no clue. Um, after playing the game and trying it a few times until I sat down to write about it and talk about it tonight and publish the review that's already live on the blog, that this actually is not a new game. It's an old game. This was published through Kickstarter under the name Exchange, a stock trading game of strategy and wit. Long enough game? Well, at least there's nothing else named that. That was in 2018. Now, at that time, it was self-published by the designer... Eric Sillies. And yes, as far as I can tell, his name is Sillies. Now, I don't know what happened next, but backers did get their game. Based on going on Board Game Geek, I can see reviews. Like, people are like, got it, it looks like my game. 
be pretty happy with it. But somewhere in the last two years, between 2018 and now, Bicycle, the playing card company, somehow got the rights to this game. And I don't know if they bought it. They they published it with Eric's help. I, I don't know. I don't know that part of the story. But they just published an updated version of that that should have hit your store sales yesterday. I uh, noticed it is, it's on the online game stores. Now, Board Game Geek has them both under the same entry. So you can actually see the original and the new ones based on pictures people have uploaded. And I did go look at the Kickstarter, and it looks like the main change they did was updated the look. It looks like the gameplay itself is is mostly unchanged, it, as far as I can tell, and without having actually seen a Kickstarter copy. Which, which isn't totally surprising. They would be looking to buy a solid game, but have the sort they have the sort of corporate weight to put a better production quality uh, out mm-hmm. than, than most. Even successful Kickstarters are able to do because of the manufacturing capabilities that Bicycle has at their fingertips. Fair enough. Now, Bicycle did contact me. They asked if I wanted to check this game out. Um, they, it was at the same time they offered me a copy of the Alpha, which I talked about a couple weeks back. So I did receive a review copy of this, and no other compensation was provided. Now, if you want to see what you get in this updated copy of Exchange, be sure to check, check out our unboxing video on YouTube. We'll be sure to drop a link to that in the show notes. Now, as usual, I'm not going to get into all the components here, uh, but I do want to call it one component in specific, and that is the player boards. Every player gets their own ledger board that you use to track how many shares you own in each of the three commodities in the game. And these are fantastically made. They're like double thick, like they're almost three thickness cardboard. Like uh, you don't have to see these things. Like check out the unboxing video for this. But it is a like double thick cardboard with, plastic sliders that are in there that you didn't have to put in they came assembled like there's nothing to snap in here that you use to slide and track your your level on everything like this is fantastic looking like this is a step above you know having notches on a two-layer player board to hold your bits this is like a full built cardboard slider system it's really impressive i i'm really impressed by this I, it very cool component for this game and again, while we do love our Indian small print runs and Kickstarter stuff, Bicycle and or their parent company owns their manufacturing process. All of it. The whole kit and caboodle, which keeps their costs lower and allows for this kind of quality bump without too much of a cost jump to the end consumer. Yeah, this is not an expensive game. Uh, retail is $30 US, so... Now, as for the game, the mechanics, Exchange is one of the most pure stock market games I've ever seen. This is basically the same thing I'd say Chinatown is the most pure trading game. This is the most pure stock market exchange game I've ever seen. Now, the backstory is you're a trader in the early days of Wall Street back in 1792, just after the signing of the Buttonwood Agreement. And to be honest, I don't know what that means either. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but I know it has to do with founding the stock exchange. To start the game, you get a hand of founder cards. These are all based on actual historic figures, and you're going to pick one of those to play. That broker determines your starting portfolio and starting cash, so how much you have of the three commodities and how much cash you have on hand. Are these historical financial figures or more generic historical people? No, these are historic people. These are actual people who were involved in the founding of Wall Street. So by name, it tells you their job and their name. And then I have no idea if their portfolio is based on anything historical. Probably not. That part's probably made up. But they are all actual people. Um, the first game I played was uh, a rich Spanish nobleman, whereas um, one of my daughters played the master of the port. And I think Deanna just played a broker. So they And they have actual names and they are real people. Now, exchange breaks your the entire market down into only three commodities. Uh, you have bonds, banks, and insurance. Each is represented by a color, orange, green, and blue. Players are going to track their portfolio on that ledger board that I already talked about, the really shiny thing. Um, and then the price of each stock is on a main playing board. And the main playing board just has a bunch of columns going from 10 to 90. There's these small D4-like markers that are placed on it. They're little pyramids that literally look like D4s without numbers on them to show the value of each stock. They all start at 50 bucks. Now, the game is played over five rounds, broken into a number of phases. In phase one, 
everyone decides secretly which commodity they want to interact with, whether it's bonds, banks, or insurance. They do this by taking one of three cards and sliding it into this cool card holder. Then the card holder is designed so all you see is the top of the card. And then you put that face down, you wait till everyone else has, has each picked their own commodity card, and then you flip it up. And then everyone can see what everyone else selected. So a bit of a social aspect here, trying to work out what your opponents think might be planning on doing, but not quite a prisoner's dilemma like there was in Alpha. No, definitely not. No, this is, a, especially this first one, right? Like, there's, there's definitely a, huh, what are they going to go for? I'm going to look at their board and I'll be like, wow, they don't have any of this, so maybe they're going to buy some of it or they have a lot. This phase one, there's not a lot to go off of, but once you get to phase two, everyone decides what they're doing with that commodity they picked. And your options are really simple, buy or sell stock. And then the amount you buy or sell from one to nine. Now, again, you're going to pick a card and put it into a sleeve. And again, these sleeves are neat, so only parts show. So what it is, is if you put the card in one way, it'll say buy at the top. And if you put it in the other way, it says sell at the top. And the nice part is the sleeve is going to hide the value. So all it's going to show is if you're buying or selling, whereas you're going to know if you're buying or selling one through nine. So again, everyone picks one, put it face down. Once everyone's done, flip it over. No, you're not actually buying and selling yet. That comes later. So even more social deduction, but yeah. now you see where everyone is acting, but uh -huh. are working out how they will act in what, you know, to what degree. Yep. That's exactly it. So here's where, like, that first phase, you're probably kind of guessing. This second phase, now you're looking. You're like, look, Big G's only got two banks, and they only cost 30 bucks. She's obviously going to be buying. Then I look over at Deanna and I'm like, huh, she's got like five of each commodity. I have no clue if she's going to buy or sell, right? Like, and your determination of what you're going to do. But that market's going to change, which leads to phase three. This is where we manipulate the market. Every player is going to pick a commodity card. Again, there's the three different commodities. You have one card for each and it's either plus one or minus one on each. So you're going to have the price go up one on the, on the scale or go down one on the scale. Same deal, put it in a sleeve, Everyone picks it, you put it face down, you flip it up and see what happens. So, more, more of the same, but I assume these rounds can be pretty quick once everyone's used to the game and playing and, and you're not actually hemming and hawing too much, or is there a real strong potential for uh, deep thought and really drawing these out if someone gets some uh, trouble? We definitely haven't seen any of that um my oldest daughter is famous for taking a long time to decide what to do in every game as we'll talk about later when we get to quad heroes <laughs> um she does like to take her time and hem and haw but even that this is a lightning quick game uh 45 minutes is what's listed on board game geek i think we were finishing quicker than that most times it's a lightning fast game and that's it these are the three decisions you basically make because after you've now made phase one, what commodity, what you're doing with the commodity, and how you're going to influence the market, we then do the market manipulation. So the first thing that happens is a random element. You're going to flip a market event card. There's a good stack of these, like a good number. Um, again, these are supposedly based on some historic events that affected the market. Now, it doesn't say specifically like the plague of whatever year. It'll say stuff like plague affects this or drought in the prairies causes this or whatever. But they, they are based on actual things that have influenced the market over time. And then that'll cause one or more commodities to change value, either up or down. Then the market's further adjusted by the influence cards everyone played. Now, there's one additional twist. In this game, and I think this is an uh, attempt at realism, the person who has the most money controls the lobby. They get a special lobbyist card that allows them to play a second influence card and influence the market twice. And they actually plan that back in phase three, the same time they're doing theirs. So whoever has the most money actually gets a little, gets to play with the market a little more. Interesting. I wonder if there's a random event for President Tweets. Um, mm. No, no, so, this is 1790, whatever. So this it's is the modern the version of exchange. <laughs> so this is the real meat of the of the game and the action where the ran and also where randomness comes into play, uh, as well as having that additional effect by the richest person. Yes. Uh, you know, this is this is where it really plays out. Yeah, I agree because it's only now after the market's been manipulated that you actually do the actions that you picked earlier. This is when you actually buy and sell. So you may like this this can be interesting right depending on what happened to the market like when you went 
to sell and you put plus one price, you didn't know the other four players all put minuses and all of a sudden you're selling for less than you bought for and so on. So you were going to play through five rounds. And again, that's it. There's three phases, then a resolution really for the rest of the phase. You do that five times, then you get one final thing where the bell dings and the market's closing. What you can do in that last round is everyone just plays phase three, so you can influence the market once. And you don't get to use the rich person doesn't get the bonus. So you get that one last chance to change the price, and then you just sum up your portfolio. You look at your money and how much all your stocks are worth, and whoever has the most valuable portfolio wins. Simple and kind of to be expected winning conditions for a yep. stock exchange game. Now, there is one other very important part of the game, and that is the effect of market bubbles and bubbles bursting. So the board I mentioned earlier goes from 10 to 90. But if any time during the market manipulation, a market piece, one of those D4s, goes off the edge of the board, it actually wraps around to the other end, which greatly changes the price, right? So something you think is at 90 suddenly gets pushed up one too many, the bubble bursts, and all of a sudden it's only worth 10 bucks a share. Now, this is what this is meant to represent thematically is market bubbles bursting and a huge part of the strategy of the game is trying to either have those bubbles happen or avoid them because having a market burst just before you sell like when you're on 90 and someone pushes that over you could be really hurt and then the other way is you may go try to buy cheap and all of a sudden a bubble happens the other way when you didn't expect it and you end up paying a fortune for stocks you may not have actually wanted and you're stuck in at this point because you have to buy or sell what you put that card in. And if you can't buy, you then have to start liquidating your assets and all you get is half the value of what's currently on the board. And interestingly enough, though I hear it's extremely rare, you can be eliminated for the game if you can't buy everything you said you were going to buy even after liquidating all your assets. Now, can you can you push it down? So if you buy it at 10 and then push it down, another, it goes up, it to, goes 90. up to 90. Oh, okay. Yes. Yep, it wraps right, both, it ways. Go both ways. And that is a big strategy of the game is trying to do it. And a big part of it is watching what the other players are doing, right? If it's at 10, are you going to try to buy at 10? Or maybe you're going to sell and try to drop the market. And if you're going to do that, maybe I push it up, right? Like that's that whole social deduction aspect. Right. Well, again, we've got simple concepts with minimal action sets and resources to work, but a surprisingly complex game, as we know the stock market is. Yes. Um, not quite simulationist, but uh, pretty, pretty, pretty sort of uh, you know a broad a broad overview simulation of right. the yeah, market. Yeah, an over like a, a zoomed out stock market with only three commodities. Right. I gotta say, so far I dig what Exchange is doing. Like it's super straightforward, right? It is a market game. It's the kind of thing I honestly think this seems like it would be a great market system to be in a bigger game. Like, this could have been the market in Clans of Caledonia, and whenever you go to buy bread, you have to, like, instead of using your trader to do it, you have your little cards, and you sit there, and you have a market phase instead of having to use a, a worker placement spot, right? Uh, uh, Clans of Caledonia is probably not the best example, but it's the most recent economic game I played besides this. But some other, like, this, I actually would have preferred this system to, say, the one in Planet Steam, because that one's overly complicated with different market influences. It is just a really drilled down bare bones stock market game which is really neat and and it's it's great because of how quick and straightforward it is the other thing i like too is this is just approachable right like there aren't many people out there that don't know the basic stock trading right buy low you sell high right that's that's the general premise people get monetary transactions right like everyone handles money every day yes most of it's digital nowadays but you get you buying and selling things, which makes this a great game for people who may not otherwise play a hobby board game. Like this is the kind of game, and again, this fits Bicycle's market in my mind, because this seems like the kind of game that'd be popular people who like poker or like, especially betting games, games with money, right? Because there's that push your luck element. There's that, I'm going to try to buy it too, but you might burst the bubble. And, oh, you burst my bubble. It's I think people would enjoy it. And I can also see this being popular with anyone who enjoys playing market games, right? Comic games. Absolutely. Uh, luckily, there happens to be a large portion of hobby gamers who happen to love economic strategy games. So if this hits the sweet spot on difficulty versus reward, enough to capture the intro, introductory gamers and established gamers, this could be a real hit game. Yeah, I, I have to admit it. When I got the all from the exchange, 
I was excited to review the Alpha. It looked cool. It, Alpha looked neat. It's got wooden meeple, and I thought my kids would really dig it. And this one, I put on the back burner. You'll note it took a couple weeks to get to this review compared to the other one. And this is way better than I thought it would be. Like, it's not groundbreaking. It's not amazing. It's not the best economic game I've ever played. But it is such a distilled down, solid, simple, quick game. And there's just something to be said about games that take a basic mechanic. A basic mechanic of market speculation, market manipulation, and buying and selling. And just using them to do that in a straightforward way. Like, that's all there is to the game. And then you throw in the one random element where things change that isn't influenced by the players. And you could play this... If you prefer to play with pure open information, remove that random element. And then it's only the players who are affecting the market, which would be a very interesting way to play it. Now, I will admit it does need three players, which makes sense because I, any market manipulation game with two players becomes haves and haves nots, right? Because market manipulation, again, is, is almost a, way, a form of area control, right? You're trying to collect all the stocks. You're trying to get more than your opponent's. So there is that aspect of that, and that never works great with two. Now, this does play up to six, and I got to say, with six people, that market's all over the place. So there is a loss of control when you play with more players because six people moving the three things, almost everything's going to move. Whereas when you play with three people, there's a good chance one of the commodities is probably going to stay exactly where it is, and two people are probably going to fight over another, and then someone's probably going to do a third, or all three players are just going to gang up on one spot. Where once you're playing with six people, that those markers are going to go everywhere. And I think the game feels less tight that way. That makes sense. All right, well, for a more in-depth look at the exchange, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now, for Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? All right, every week we like to take this look back, uh, take a look at the games we played, any events we attended, other cool gaming stuff that's going on. Right now, the events, as I was ranting earlier during our coffee break, are not happening. While I would have liked to have been at Origins in Columbus, Ohio right now, that didn't happen, but I did get some gaming in here at home, so... Started off with a um, uh, night with uh, my wife and I and no kids um, playing some games, and we played some more Unlabeled. Now, that's that beer rating game that I've talked about actually quite a bit recently. Um, the only reason I want to bring it up again is that we did figure out a hack for it to add IBUs. Those are international bitterness units for you non-beer snobs. It's something that I personally think is greatly missing from the game. IBUs are a huge part about the taste of beer, and it seems really wrong to have a beer tasting game and not consider IBUs. So what we did, we had been talking about making our own, but instead we just hacked it. So there's a scoring track there that goes from 1 to 20. And we just decided you put your barrel on the number and it's a multiple of 10. So if you put it on 20, you're guessing the IBUs are from 20 to 29. Whereas if you put it on four, you're guessing the IBUs are between 40 and 49. And that actually worked really well. I was surprised. Now it's a little too nuanced. Like, like guessing that smaller range is a little rough. So we're thinking about maybe expanding it so that if you get it right on, it's worth three points, where if you're within 10, it's worth two points. You're within three, it's worth one point or something like that. But it did improve the game. Like I definitely improve it having that other factor in there. Now, if only that game had a better beer listing, because, wow, this last play, there were three beers that just weren't on the board. Like, there was one where even the style wasn't there. Like, it's not even, like, all I, all we could bet was, I, I remember Deanna picked it, and I was trying to rate it, and I'm like, I don't know, I'm guessing this is a Sasson or something. And she's like, all right, it's a this. And I can't remember what it was. A Celebration Lager, I think it was. And I'm like, all right, so it's a lager. Where's Celebration Lager fall under? There's nothing on here. Is it a light lager? Is it an amber lager? No, it's a celebration lager. And we're like, no, it was a California common lager. Sorry, Deanna's correcting me in the chat. I couldn't remember. The celebration lager, I don't think there was celebration lager either. But there was at least the, the, the right style. So that's driving me nuts. Like, I don't know. Whoever made this game, where did you get your list of beer types? Like, you obviously didn't go to Rate Beer or on which are the two major beer review rating websites on the web. They're like the board, board game geek of beer is... is is, is ratebeer.com. How did you not use ratebeer.com to get your list of, of, site, uh, of, of styles? I don't know. 
So there's still a very small chance at some point Mo will sit down and kickstart his own version of this game. I, uh, maybe I'll get the untapped license because everyone knows untapped. So we'll get the untapped license and logo on there and we'll get to use the actual official untapped styles and tie it all together. But until then, we're still having fun with it. It's, it's, it's you know what? It, it's, it's a fun diversion. It's something to do while you're there anyway. Yeah, I mean, hack it till it works. If you're going to be drinking, there might as well be a game that, that goes along with it. Uh, I, I do suspect that the game was probably aimed at a, a different class of beer snob than perhaps you Maybe. are. I mean, there's a lot of people, uh, you know, we uh, Canadians joke a lot about American beer and, and, yeah. and things. And I there are certain selections or areas where selections are dramatically reduced compared to yeah. what we in, in Ontario have available to us. Um, so it could be as simple as that. Whereas, you know, yeah, I don't know. they were aiming for a more mass market than the, uh, the extreme niche beer snobs. See, I don't know, because then there's a whole chart on the fermentation type that has seven different options. So I, I just think wherever they're from, care about different aspects of beer than where we are. Right. Like, I think they're, 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 they're just as much beer snobs, because I don't even know what harvest fermentation means and i'm a beer snob and that's one of the options i'm like no i know what an ale is and i know what a lager is and that's it all beers are one of the two pretty much right but then not having ibus like are you in a part of the world where you don't care how bitter your beer is but you care that much about how it's fermented because i don't care how it's fermented like i know it I'm, I'm already choosing lager or ale on the board why do i have to pick it on the side of the board too because it might just be that rare beer that's harvest fermented so i don't know i, I think it's beer snobs from a different region is what it is i think that's but i just where'd they get their list i don't know it drives me nuts <laughs> and then, yeah, as deanna points out it's broken down more than you would expect in some areas right like you go to chocolate porter and there's six types of chocolate porters but there's no celebration lagers <laughs> But where they're from, maybe they have a lot of porters. I don't know. Anyway, enough about Unlabeled. You know what? We'll probably talk about this one again. We're, we're in quarantine. We're home a lot. When we get, uh, the, finally the kids got to go to my mother-in-law's because we're allowed to expand up. So we had a few drinks. And it's one of those things, like Sean said, we're having the drinks anyway. Why don't, grab, why don't we grab Unlabeled? And that was literally it. We were like, eh, why not? All right, up next, enough about beer and Unlabeled. Uh, board game i kickstarted that <laughs> i have some opinions on uh we played our second play of shadow kingdoms of valeria this is one people on my social media feed are going nuts for i've got people already uh chomping at the bit to get this game this is the latest game from daily magic games and the valeria system you play the bad guys um this did way better than our first play i'm sure we did something extreme though i don't remember what but i, I remember there was some we realized we did wrong. Uh, but what really helped was this again, that the, the second play, we knew what we were doing. And the game played way quicker. Like, to be honest, there's only six options every round. And they're pretty simple. It's draft the die from six different spots and get a bonus or go to war. And that's it. And it was quick. Like, it was really quick. I grab a die, I grab a die, die grab a die, grab a die. I reserve a battle. She reserves a battle. I go to battle. She goes to battle. I put a chip out. Like, it was really really interesting to see how how much the game flowed once now knowing like what the goals are what you're trying to do it was also interesting to see important some of the aspects of the game are that didn't weren't obvious the first play so one of them is how important magic is so magic is that that same blue meeple blue chip like every this is one of the things i like about daily magic games all their games use the same iconography all the valeria games so it's that blue triangle is your magic right and in this game you collect magic well in all the other games you use that to like fight undead and stuff well what it lets you do in this game is two things it lets you modify your die rolls so one magic spins a die up one but also it lets you shuffle through the cards that are on the deck so on the board so if there's three champions up you could hire you can just spend a magic to throw one of them to the bottom of the deck and put another one up and that is way more powerful than it seems at first so our first game i don't think we did it at all whereas this game there was definitely the go fish moments where i'm like no no get rid of that guy and that guy because i want to see some new ones so that was cool uh gems were even more powerful than i thought gems let you we used them the last time to flip dice. So they let you take, take a one and turn it into a six or a three into a four, right? Flip your die over. But they also let you use any die as wild. And I did that a lot more this game. And I didn't do that at all the first game. So that was a big thing. 
And then finally was how important the cards are. So here we get into the whole, I've been trying to say this isn't a card-based game like the other Valeria games, but there is a bit of tableau building to this. So along with your dice and everything else, you can hire champions, and they're represented by cards with Miko art on it, so you get that whole thing. It starts off, you can only have three of them, but you can upgrade that to eventually have nine of them. Well, one of the goals in our game, which change every game, there's the randomized, was the first person to have six champions could get a bonus. So both of us hired way more champions, and man, they had more of an impact on the game than I expected. So that tableau building aspect is definitely there, definitely has that Valeria Card Kingdoms feel, and definitely seemed to work. So so the cards are important. I still wouldn't say this is a card game. It just, that's an aspect of the game. Now, with all that good stuff, I do have one complaint, and that is the fact that I wish there was more asymmetry. Like, everyone knows I love asymmetry, right? I get it. It, of course, Mo wants more asymmetry, but when we first played, it felt more asymmetric because we had to pick a map board, and there's a bunch of different boards. I think there's five different ones, and they're two-sided, and we each got one, and I'm like, mine's different from yours, so it's asymmetric. Well, it ends up, they're all identical in the fact that they all have the same nine things on the board. They're just in different order. So, like, yeah, okay, it's asymmetric, but not really. Like, like you, your stuff's just in a different place. So I found that a little disappointing. And then you're playing these armies, right? There's like undead and there's orcs and there's goblins. And the only thing that matters is which die is wild for your race. So if you're goblins, the green dice can be any die. If you're undead, the black dice can be any dice. If you're orcs, the red dice can be any dice. And that's it. Like that's the only thing asymmetric, which really to me isn't even really asymmetric because everyone has the same power. It's just a different color. I would have much preferred that the orcs did something, I don't know, and, and the undead did something, and like something literally unique to all the other races, instead of just a variation on the same theme. Yeah. Well, all the games can't be dripping with all that beautiful <laughs> asymmetry. No, they can't. But you know what? There's just, you have five races. Like, if you're going to have asymmetry, this is the kind of game to have it, to me. All right, up next was uh, a good game, A Fox in the Forest. Um, I don't have much more to say about this game. We've been talking about it. Read my review. Huge thumbs up. We like Fox in the Forest. It's now added to our date night game list. It's now going to get packed whenever we go on vacation, all of that. Deanna and I are definitely fans. Uh, I noticed Tech showed up in the chat room. So, again, thanks, Tech, for a copy of the game. Gift of a game that keeps on giving. All right, up next, something new, sort of, new to us. Uh, but not new at all. This is a game from 1996. So some dust on this one as GIF, G-I-P-F-H. Uh, this is an abstract strategy game that I've owned from some time. Uh, we were literally sitting down in the basement trying to decide what to play. And I kind of wanted to play Eclipse and Deanna didn't want to play anything heavy. So we were kind of in that holding pattern of what do you want to play? What do you want to do? And I'm looking around and I saw GIF and I went, you know what? Let's give this a shot. Mainly to decide, because I've been purging my collection recently, of whether I should keep it or sell it and make room for something else. So it looks much better on the table, seeing your picture, than uh, yeah. on Boitajou and, and, and some of the other games uh, like it on, on Boitajou. Yeah, they said they, they, they took an abstract game and made it work look worse, which is that that's work. Like that takes effort because this game wouldn't have been hard to make look good. Like this, this is a pretty, pretty generic looking game. So why GIF, right? So Deanna and I like two player abstract games. Like we've learned this over the years. I would have never thought, you know, like when we were dating that like our favorite board games would be abstracts. I would have assumed to be like fantasy adventure D&D style games, but no, we actually love the abstracts. Like, like Onitama, the Duke and War Chest are probably our three favorite date night games to bring out. I actually thought Deanna might enjoy this. Or she might not. This could go either way because it's so abstract. Like there, there isn't even a pasted on theme here. Where at least Omni Tama, your your senseis and and martial artists fighting in the Duke, your your uh, whatever, your chest armies and and war chest, your literal units moving on the board. This is no, your discs moving on a grid. There's there's no theme. And I man, she really enjoyed it enough that by the end of the night, she's like, you better not be thinking getting rid of this. And I'm like, no, 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 we're gonna keep it. So just a brief overview of GIF, because this isn't something I'm going to throw out a full review on, so I'm just going to cover it briefly here. You have this hex-shaped grid of connected lines, and on where the lines connect are where you're going to put pieces. Every turn, you're going to pick a spot on the edge of the board, and you're going to slide your piece onto the board following the line. Now, when you do so, any piece in the way will slide down to make room, though it'll stop if it 
it gets to a point where it would be pushed off the board. So you can only push so far. They, they run out of room. You continue adding pieces like this, taking turns. I put one, slide it on. Deanna puts one, slides it on. And keep doing this, pushing and putting parts until someone makes a row of four. And that could be your color or the opponent's. When that happens, those four pieces are captured along with any other pieces touching those four in the same row. When you capture your own pieces, they just go in with the rest of your pieces so you can keep playing and reuse them. When you capture your opponent's pieces, they're removed from the game. The first player who can't play because they don't have any pieces left loses the game. Now, that's the basic game. That's It's, it's simple but not easy, I guess is a good way to explain it. Now, the full game adds in what they call the gift pieces, uh, which is just two pieces stacked on top of each other. And this is brilliant because what happens with these is when you make a set of four, you have the option to leave them on the board or remove them. Now, when you remove them, they're going to count as two more pieces for you to use. They split, which is cool. So it's a way to get more pieces if you're running low. But if you ever have no gift on the board, you lose. And I got to say, like, we played four games. I think it was. we played a bunch of games in a row uh, with the basic rules and then with the gift rules. and. It takes those three games to really start to grasp the strategy and tactics of this game. It is actually really brilliant. It's one of those you look at it and go, man, how did someone think of this? Yeah, no, it's uh, even between the grade school graphics on uh, uh, Botteju, it wasn't something that really caught my eye. But uh, just taking a quick look at the the designer on uh, Board Game Geek, they have an interesting set of naming uh, things. Now, uh, yes. they, are, they are Belgian, so I don't know okay. if there is a language issue, but uh, a number of the games are, so we have Gipf, uh, Ginch, Zertz, Zar, and that's not, not Zar, like T-Z-A-A-R, uh, yep. Devon, and Ling, <laughs> Ling. Um, are, yeah, are Ling. just some of them. Um they do have some interest, some some normal named games in their in their yes. uh, list as well. But there's a a number of uh, strange. So here's the part that I didn't get into in the show notes, but I'll bring up here. All of those games are part of something called the GIP project, and it ends up that they're all in some messed up way compatible. If you own the base game GIF, the GIF piece that's two pieces stacked is called a potential. And instead of being able to play with your gift potential, you could instead, if you own Czar, decide to make a Czar potential. But what you do is you stop your game of gift, you go over and play a game of Czar, and if you win the game of Czar, you get to put your Czar potential in play in gift. Now, that is a really high level version of it, but it is messed up. Like the entire concept is just weird to me that you stop playing a game to potentially put a new piece in another game. And man, is it weird. Like I, we were sitting there and after we played the first couple games, I gave the end of the rule book and I'm like, you think this is neat. Read this crazy idea for the gift project. And again, it doesn't explain the weird names, but there is this thing. And the other thing is you can actually go out and just buy these little boxes with the pieces from like Yinch. If you didn't want to actually buy Yinch, so you could just have the potentials. And then instead of doing the whole, let's stop and play a game of Yinch, you could be like, well, I like my game of GIF. It'd be like poker, right? Like, we're going to play Queen's High, five card stud. I know nothing about poker, so I'm going to sound like an idiot right now. But you could do that with GIF. Like, oh, I prefer to play GIF with two Yinch potentials and a Zar potential. That's my way to play GIF. And the whole project is just like, I don't know. It's it's uh, it's strange. It's weird. It's um, definitely, I'm trying to think of the word interesting that they're trying to do this and the fact they're still putting out games must mean it worked at least to some point well an interesting little factoid from uh the website of uh gift.com uh the antwerp city hall in belgium was where three editions of tog the other game were held uh which <laughs> okay. was a an abstract game event where they had 1500 square meters with nothing but abstract two-player games wow a month after the third time they held the event, the city hall burned to the ground and they've never held it again. <laughs> okay. But it sounds it like, based there on, was an angry player. Based on, <laughs> uh, on, on this, it, it seems like they're, they're, these are acronyms. 
Um, yeah, I'm so sure there's, they there's must. acronyms behind all of this, whether or not they're they're Belgian, French, or Probably, otherwise. Yeah. Uh, it does seem that there there are acronyms behind all of them. They are all capitalized. All these yep. all these game names are capitalized. So, so I have to fully admit, all I own is GIF. I have tried a couple of the other ones online. They all seem like interesting games. They all do funky things with pieces that stack on generically hexagonal boards. That's like a an oh, excuse me, that's like an overall theme for the games. I I find the whole GIF project neat and interesting. I I kind of want to like. These games are old. I don't even know if you can find some of the older ones that are actually compatible anymore. I am tempted, I gotta admit. Like, it's one of the... I have this bad habit of I play a game and I want the expansions, right? I had that feeling. I'm like, I just want to go get one of them. I don't know which one, Czar or Yinch, just so we can do the whole... I want to be able to add a gift, a Yinch potential to my game of GIF. I wish I had the rule book up here because I would read out loud this section on potentials just because it's so such a strange concept, yet fascinating. But it, on its own, I think GIF is a fantastic game. If, if you like, math is not the right word, but that that abstract strategy, I don't know what, what type of thinking that is. I know it's a certain type of thinking. You need to do that. It's definitely about placements. Um, we, we previously reviewed Zentico. This is like Zentico on drugs. This is like crazy complicated compared to that. It's, it's, it's a step above your nine men Morris and just trying to make a pattern of four. So 1997 right. was the uh, the in the beginning of the Gip saga. 97. What? That doesn't make sense because Gip was published in 96. Sure, not according to the site Gip.com. All right. <laughs> well, it's listed as 1996 published date on Board Game Geek. So I don't know. Oh, that's weird. where I got it from. Weird. Because yeah, they have the the, the Gip site has 1997 right. as the first game of Project Gip. Maybe that was the first game as part of the project, whereas GIF on its own was 1996. Awesome. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. Anyway, enough about GIF. GIF's neat. I, I, I'm going to have it. So anyone local wants to try GIF, just give me a heads up when we're allowed to actually meet up again. And I'll happily bring it out. Because I got to say, despite the very ugly board, the pieces are really nice. Hmm. Like they have that nice clacky, they stack really nice. They're even designed so you can get your fingers around them, which is important for me because I stink at picking things up off tables for whatever reason Deanna likes to put the pieces the other way around and I have a hard time picking them up but as long as you stack them properly it's easy to pick up but not vote GIF uh, one more game well, actually a couple but one one more one I want to talk about extensively and that is Quad Heroes uh, this is from Wonder Mint Games Ryan Eiler um, came down to Windsor and showed off this game uh, we did our first game with the girls using the non-tutorial rules so everything on the board all the cards not all the cards because there's one specific to scenarios but like all the basic deck all the basic event deck the the basic market deck exploration deck uh this was just me and the girls we did um it was a rally point based one like uh you had to hit point one two three four five um compared to the tutorial there were way more checkpoints than usual uh there were some really neat board elements like pit traps and switches like when you stepped on the switch all the pit traps opened you stepped on another switch they all closed so that was cool and way more cards um in the decks including more pets and items which are the ones that you're each allowed one of uh this went really well uh, the girls love this game like especially my oldest big g like this i think it may be her favorite board game it's it is she she comes to me almost daily and is like, can we play Quad Heroes again? Like, she is loving this game. Um, the problem with this game, though, was how... So the, the scenario, this is a one-hour scenario, and this one and a half. Now, part of this is the fact there were new elements, right? There were new cards and new gameplay elements. So that did take longer. But just in general, I think it was because we were playing with kids. So I kind of mentioned this earlier when we were playing exchange with one of the girls is uh my oldest daughter can have some ap problems and in this game that happens but what happened in this one was the board changed a lot more so the world events can really shift your position on the board between rounds so they are often like there's a strong wind everyone blows two spots or there's something suddenly explodes or a board turns 90 degrees and that makes it really hard to plan ahead so whereas in the tutorial it was very much the, I'm going to do this, then this, then this. And I just had to wait for my turn to do it. Whereas this was, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Oh, Jen, pu G pushed me. 
or oop, ah, the board shifted, or oh, someone threw a spring down where I was planning on moving. So now I'm not saying this is a problem. I'm not saying it's bad, but it is something that at least I'm going to have to be aware of when playing with the girls to like at least double the play time as shown for the scenarios. Now, I don't know if that's, again, playing with kids or if it's just the random elements of what happened or if that particular scenario was off on the time. I don't know. It's, it's I, I realize that there's the whole meme of never trust the time on the box, but this was surprise. Like, this is more than double. This is two and a half times longer than what I was expecting, which is mainly just a problem because, well, my kids needed to go to bed because they had schoolwork in the morning and we were up till 1030 playing quad heroes. So, yeah, it's always tough when a game even a learning game takes that much longer than expected. Yeah. And again, I, I, I don't fault quad heroes, but if you're going to play it, just be aware that you may need more time than indicated in the book. Now, the other game I did play this week was some plays of exchange, but I think I covered that pretty well in our game room segment in the review segment. So I don't think you need to hear any more about that one. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What games do you have planned for the coming week? All right, so as I mentioned in the announcement section at the top of the show, I do have some unboxings to do. Uh, for those of you here live, you'll get to see what if you stick around at the end of the show. Um, I did finally get my pieces in for Eclipse from uh, Lutapil.fl or whatever the name of that company is. They, they came in in... Um, Man, I've never seen so much bubble wrap. It looked like just an envelope that was overfilled, but it was just layer and layer and layer. Like, they, they really wrapped this stuff up. So I am really looking forward to playing this. I hope Deanna's listening. Um, I like me some Eclipse. I am looking forward to playing. Uh, I realize it'll probably be a two-player game, but I have a feeling Big G might dig this one too, though. It's going to be a step above what we usually play with her. But you know what? At that age, I was playing stuff like this. I was playing more complicated games than this at that age. So I think she'll dig it. So I'm looking forward for that. Plus, now that we can, um, we, we have in Ontario now where we live, we're allowed to have a group of people we can hang out with. So we have expanded our family to um, include Deanna's mother and sister. And Dee's mom is actually a huge board gamer. Like, not huge, like she plays all the time, but she loves board games. She loves playing them. Now, Eclipse is not necessarily her kind of thing. She's more of a word games ticket to ride player. But you know what? It is someone else I can play it with, and I am really looking forward to playing it. So I don't know if that's going to be two-player, just Deanna and I, probably the first game, but maybe we can get her involved. Uh, plus, things are slowly opening up. So it, I don't know how long it'll be before we get the big group back together. But as long as everyone's taking things carefully, we might do it. Though I think we're going to push towards getting Tori and Cat over before that happens and uh, expand the bubble to include our Gloomhaven team. Now, other than that, I know Big G is probably already planning on asking me to play Quad Heroes again tomorrow. So <laughs> she asks me almost every day. And usually, eventually, it takes a bit because I'm busy and I find some time. And I'll, I'll definitely play that with her again. What I am really looking forward to trying in that is there is a way to play team-based without a team, without players, where you can control two heroes and your second hero has this like simplified version of their player board that has some slightly changed powers. And they, I think they call them companions. And I'm looking forward to trying with Big G a two-player game where we each have a companion. So we play a two-player team game. And I really want to check out those rules, especially before giving a final verdict on the game, because I, I want to see how well those rules work. And I think that'll be neat. And there are some interesting looking ones. There's, there's one in particular I want to try is called Sheep Soccer where you have sheep that spawn in the middle of the board and your goal is to get the sheep to the opponent's end zone while your opponent's trying to do that the same and get to so many points, which just sounds very different from everything we played in the game so far. And I don't think that's going to work well with two quads. I think we need the team to do that. So I'm looking forward to some more quad heroes with Big G. All right. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Sean P. Kelly. Thanks, Mr. S and B S. Andrew Dacey. Thank you. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark. Join the Misdirected Mark team every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering at twitch.com slash misdirected mark. Evil John. Man, the your snacks are killing me. They are. I'm, I'm going to go to Texas just to eat, have a snack, as you like to word it. I was so trying to get you to say that. <laughs> that to see if, if you would actually <laughs> read that out or not. Uh, yeah. uh. 
Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhop through our Patreon. Patreon.com slash you know what. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every day. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, join, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on. And game on. <laughs> <laughs>